Well, my name is Juliana Nicolasian, and today is Friday, April 24th, 2009, and we are here on the Blakely Farms, probably one of the first original structures here, and I'm here with Mr. Bud Blakely. So thank you for joining us today. This oral history project is being conducted as part of the uh, Oklahoma Centennial Farms Families Oral History Project through the Oklahoma State University Library. Uh, Mr. Bud, I'd like you to get started and tell me how your family came to this land. Well, they came here in uh, 1907 and uh, rode a train into Kendrick and they bought the farm just prior to that and they uh, had a team and wagon that moved all their furniture out here and moved into this log cabin here. It's 14 by 18 log cabin. Hmm. And where, where did they originally come from? They came from uh, Indiana and Illinois. I'm not sure which, but they lived in both of them right on the line, but we didn't, we didn't know a lot about them until you know, the last few years when we were learning some of the history. Well, tell me a little bit about them. Well, my grandpa, when, of course I knew him, he was still worked in the field some, but uh, uh, my grandmother, I didn't know, she she died before I was born. But uh, my dad moved back here to the farm in the late 20s and uh, worked on the farm until he died, until my grandpa died, I guess, both. And uh, they were real hard workers. And we, we grew up on the farm doing manual labor and uh, did a lot of farming, picking up pecans and baling hay. And, Oh, and corn, peanuts, and that sort of stuff. So the original acreage was how large? Uh, when they first came here, they bought 160 acres, and that's where the uh, log cabin is at. And shortly thereafter, they built a frame house here next to us, and they built the lower story first, and a few years later, they jacked it up and uh, put the underneath floor under it now, as it says today, two-story. And my dad, in the 50s, put a porch on it, and, Built a little room on it. We did several remodels on it, but the most extensive remodel came this past year when we completely redid the house and made another bathroom and uh, fixed it up. And now my grandson lives in it. And, uh, that's worked out pretty good. He'll be the fifth generation that has lived in the house. So tell me a little bit about the building we're in today. Well, I just kind of know. You know, when I was a kid here, it was just, just an old log cabin. Uh, the underneath part's the cellar, and my mom filled it up with canned goods every year. And, uh, you know, they, they, they just filled it up, everything. We, we had everything farm-raised. You know, we had all of our vegetables we put in, and plus some blackberries and plums, and uh, some of the things that uh, we went out and picked in a while. And uh, it, it just served as, as a place for us to live and eat and they raised us boys and uh, we worked hard and now we've tried to come back to it and find out a little bit about it and, and uh, it's really been rewarding. So this uh, this house has pretty much a, a very good unique history in terms of the family. How many family members lived in here at one time? When they first moved in here in uh, 1907 or so uh, there was a uh, uh, seven kids and my grandpa and my grandmother. There was uh, four boys and three girls that moved into it. And grandpa and grandma, then a year or so later, the last son, Merle Blakely, that owned the B&B store the last time after the Blakeleys owned it, I, uh, he was born here and uh, made uh, nine of them living here then, or 10 of them living here, excuse me, uh, till they got the house over here finished. Hmm. And uh, anybody born in here? Uh, no, not that I know of. Nobody was born here. Uh, all of us kids was... Oh, here. The, the three of us, I believe three or four of us, was born in the farmhouse here. Okay. Uh, now there's also a well out back. What can you tell me about this well? Well, it, it was there, as long as I can remember, it was just an old hand dug well and uh, always had water in it from day one and the spring right below it kind of the spring leached out there and there was always water there year-round you know so it never dried up 
in the early day, you know, we used to, in fact, I don't know how fish got down in there, but we'd, we'd catch a little fish out of there when we was fishing here in the spring. And we didn't have much place to fish in, so that was always a big thing when we had time. So, to the best of your knowledge, can you describe the original layout of the farm for me? Originally, when they moved here, they said that uh, it was pretty well coated with uh, timber. In fact, the whole valley bottom over here that, that uh, we have in uh, wheat now, that was all just solid timber. And they uh, dug, dug around the trees and took dynamite and uh, blew the stumps out and cleared the stumps. And I, I don't know how long it took them to do that, but probably not over a year, I don't imagine. But they cleared that out and that's where they first started farming. And I think some of the, the northern place that they, we bought later, in 1917 they bought another 160 north of us here. Now we, the whole half a section is together. And uh, they raised uh, mainly cotton on it for years and years. And any cattle? Oh, we had some cows and some horses when I was a kid, but uh, you know, it was all just native grass and never was improved, so it didn't handle a, you know, the upland grass was not that good. The bottom ground we farmed, raised alfalfa and wheat and corn. And we also farmed 160 here south of us, in the Bailey place from the time I remember, we farmed it for several years. And it raised mainly just corn and alfalfa. When you were raising cotton, did you did you have harvest it? I, I did a little bit. I was pretty small. I was just probably small enough to mess up everybody's work. <laughs> but you know, this big old tow sack you had was bigger than I was. And I remember I wouldn't get my sack very full and dad would kind of get on me. My brother, three years older, you know, he'd fill his sack up. And I do remember that pulling that sack, crawling on your knees all day was, not an easy job, it's very hard work, and uh, we had a lot of it, you know, I don't know how many acres we had, but lots and lots of cotton all over both places. So we had a lot every year to pull. Most of it, some of it we picked, but most of it we just, what they call, pulled, or pulled the bowls off, threw it in. And we had a cotton gin then in Kendrick, so we was able to just take it right up to Kendrick and get rid of it after we got it and sell it. Now, did you have any other uh, chores that you had to do as a kid? Yeah, we had plenty to do. My dad was, uh, he, he worked very hard and he wanted everybody around him to work hard. So when we were young, we, about six is the most cows that I remember us milking. And I'd usually milk one or two, my brother one or two, and my dad at least two or more. And uh, we all got up well before daylight and had the milking done and over with and usually back to the house by the time that, uh, uh, daylight was here and you know had breakfast and it was off to something else in the fields. So they got you up pretty early in the morning? Always get up early and stay late. Of course when I got along into playing sports and stuff in school dad did let us participate in all that and uh, uh, you know we might have to work that night after the basketball game or softball game was over and we'd go to the fields and work. We also farmed some other land up by Kendrick and up north of Kendrick, so we, we really had probably about seven, eight hundred acres that we actually farmed. And all we had first was a little bitty A farm all tractor, then later we got a H farm all tractor, which is still sitting here. Uh, we're getting ready to have it restored, so it's been the family since the 40s, and little A's been in there, I believe, since the 30s. So, do you remember the first time you, you learned how to drive a tractor? Not exactly the first time. I know we were driving a tractor when we were very young. You know, I don't, I want to say eight or ten years old, but uh, Dad showed us how and expected us to get on it and do it. And my brother and I both, uh, we made manual hands, you know, when we were very young. We work out for other people. And he always, you know, lectures. us. Now, you, you know, you're going to be doing my job today. you got to do a good job. And, we tried, and then work was fun, so it wasn't as hard as it sounds. Now, was your, your father primarily a farmer, or did he do other things? He was mainly just a farmer. In the early 50s, uh, he had an uncle that was a carpenter, a very good carpenter, and uh, married uh, my aunt, and they lived out east of Kendrick, and uh, 
they uh, he he started doing carpenter work, and my dad and my uncle that lived here with us and Glenn Blakely, uh, they all three worked together. So when I was a kid, uh, we got in the summertime, we got to do a little bit of a roofing and a little bit of carpenter work, building some houses and stuff. So we kind of got kind of got the start that I have today in the business end. And when I went to service and came back, I couldn't find a job, so I went into that and. I've basically been building houses for 50 years. So you've seen a lot of change in the area. You've been there right on the front line. Yeah, and then there was, uh, <clears throat> we had, a, I had another uncle that lived up here at our north place and back to the west there. And uh, the one that was born here in this log cabin and they had seven girls and they lived there a while and they lived there on, on our place for a while. And then we had uh, people, you know, a quarter, half a mile around us there was other families. There was 15 or 20 families out in this area, and today there's only two of us left here in a two-mile, two-mile place. So, mm -hmm. not not near as many people as there used to be. Mm -hmm. So, what was school like? School? Well, we thought it was terrible having to go to school. I mean, we liked going, but uh, my brother and I both were sports people. You know, we played baseball and we played basketball and. I run a little bit of track and, uh, you know, we'd get up and do our chores in the morning. We still had to do all the chores and uh, a lot of times we'd ride a school bus and a lot of times we'd just run to school. It's only a mile and a half up to town and, you know, then we could run up there in just a few minutes just take off running. Of course, when it's muddy, we'd ride the bus, you know, we didn't like to run the mud, but the old hill here north of the house used to be a really tough one, you know, it was really, really hard get up and down in the rain because it's all clay and then they had no gravel whatsoever. It's pretty tough times. Were you in 4-H? Yeah, I was in 4-H for a while uh, in grade school. Uh, I may have been in it even a year or two in high school. And we, uh, oh, we had a few things. I had some chickens and uh, I think I had hogs a year or two. We, we also raised hogs on the farm. And, um, you know, we did some demonstration stuff in the county, but my heart probably wasn't into it as good as it should have been. And we never did do real well in it. Did the county agents come? Yeah, the county agents used to come out. And then as I left home and uh, my kids got into FFA in Davenport, well, uh, they come a lot to the farm here to help my dad and do things through my dad. He was very supportive of them. And today we're still supportive of both 4-H and the FFA programs in Lincoln County. Been in business all these years. We've supported them greatly. And did you do did you do much conservation efforts? Did you have any? Yeah, quite a bit in the early day. Uh, I guess my dad in the early days started uh, uh, putting in terraces. That's what he did around the county. He he worked he worked for the uh, for the county and uh, did terraces for a lot of different people. But he also had this place here all terraced and he did that of course with a team and a little list a little uh, doodle bug is what we call it you know we run it when we were kids cleaning out the uh, spring here and everything you know you run in there and hold it there till you get out then you dump it and go back get another little scoop and believe it or not they in a, in a year's time i guess they moved a lot of dirt because uh, this place probably had a hundred terraces on it and they were all with all the water drained around like it's supposed to, you know. Of course, when we came along, we had a dozer, so we pushed all the terraces out and sprigged it all in Bermuda grass. And today, you know, you don't have that. You can drive anywhere on the farm. And uh, we had a lot of ditches, erosion ditches was really bad on the North Place in the early day. And uh, when we took over the farm, we filled all that in and leveled every bit of the ground on the place, every single bit of it put it in Bermuda grass and most all of it today you can just drive anywhere on it with your eyes closed you don't have to worry about falling off in a ditch. You were talking about the conservation efforts okay since we're on that on that uh, topic tell a little bit about your ponds you said you had seven uh, talk a little bit about now those. we have 11 ponds in the early day we had one pond I think my dad built the one here on the road going in toward Kendrick I think he built that in maybe the I believe probably in the 40s and then we had one old pond down below over there that was built way in early day that we fished in and that was the only two ponds on the place 
and the rest of them uh, we come along and built in the last 20 years. With the pr purpose being? Just for agriculture purposes for the cattle. You know, we crossed when we bought it and started buying it in 83. We started cross fencing it and now we have it all blocked off in the 40s. Four 40s is blocked off and two of those 40s is blocked off into 20s and we have a pond on all of them except one and we still have one pond to build and we've been awful busy in the construction business the last few years and hopefully this year we'll get to that and get the pond built on 140. It has a creek through it so most of the time there's water in it. We don't need it but we still need it when it gets real dry like it was uh, a couple years ago. So you have cattle as your primary? Yeah. <clears throat> My dad had cows in the early day and we came along and bought this and I didn't think I'd ever come back to the farm but when I got here and seen the need for some cows to graze the grass so I, and when we planted all of Bermuda grass and started harvesting it, well, it it fed a lot more cows so now we're running about almost a hundred head of cows on the place and I think we have about 90 calves almost 90 calves now uh, you know to the last fall cows and this spring calves so we'll be selling cows in a month or two and then again in the fall so tell us a little bit about the barns on the land, the, from the old to the new. In the early day, we had a great, great big barn. And I think they built that barn real soon after they got here. I'm almost sure they did. And it was a tremendous barn. It was probably 40 by 60, and it was probably eight or nine foot downstairs. And the downstairs was all horse stalls, almost all of it. Probably take care of 12 horses at least. In the upstairs was one big open loft and in the early day they had a, a boom that came down and picked up the loose hay in the early day they always just just brought the hay in and picked it up loose and took it up there and stacked it in the loft mm -hmm. and I remember we used to have a, a horse and they'd hook up and this horse would run from all the way down to the barn all the way up to this fence and my dad would just set up there in the loft and whistle or call and, and when it he holler, G or haw, whichever they meant. Well, they'd turn around in and walk all the way back down, turn around, and he'd get another one. And, and he, they were trained, just professional. You couldn't believe how great they were trained. So uh, that's how they got their hay up into the loft. And when they got down, uh, uh, I, I don't know whether they just threw it down. I think they just threw it down by hand down below and took pitchforks and put it in the stall to, for the horses. Next barn. And we also had uh, some corn cribs here. You know, in the early day we had a lot of corn, and, and we shelled a lot of corn on on the you know dropping in here at a time. In we had a big sheller here, and I remember sitting out and doing that. That was that was hard work for several hours. And my dad had a little kind of a little blacksmith shop here. He was very good with making different metal parts and bending and stuff, and he'd heat that up and and uh, fix uh, sickles for the mowers and hoes and rakes and all the shovels, everything that he worked on, but he could, he could about build anything, you know, out of a piece of metal. Mm -hmm. And then today? Today, well, it's all changed today. We came in in early 80s and started clearing all the timber off because uh, timber just grew up and hadn't really been farmed very much in the last 20 or 30 years. After my dad got older, he just went to cows mainly and had a little bit of wheat, and that's about all he had. So we went in and cleared all the trees out except pecan trees and left them. And uh, of course, we ended up with the ice storm here a couple years ago, and uh, it did so much damage that we had to clean those up and had an awful lot of cleanup doing that. And we, when we counted up, we had 901 pecan trees. And the first year after we, a couple years after we got them all cleaned up, we had a good pecan crop and sold off about, uh, I believe it was 28,000 pounds of pecans that we sold. And uh, probably early day when we used to pick them up, two or three trees on the place that wasn't covered up with other brush, well, we might get three or four sacks of pecan. In early day, we also, my uncle had a place here to the south that had a big pecan grove on it and we used to go down there and pick up, have something else we did, we farmed it. And it had a hay mat on it and pecan trees, and we picked up pecans uh, during pecan, when we had a pecan crop. And of course, 
packaged them up and, in gunny sacks and brought them here to the house and take them in and sell them. And the time we'd have several. Well, back in your father's time and your time, how would products get to the market? Well, of course, then uh, my dad, we started baling hay when I was maybe before you, I was born, but uh, when we came along and we baled hay commercially and we baled for ourselves and other people, and we had this little pickup baler, we called it, with my brother and I rode and tied it as the bales come out the back. And uh, we did this the whole time I was in school, probably from fifth or sixth grade through high school. And uh, he would, had this big barn we had, would store several thousand bales up in the loft. I mean, it was it was huge. Of course, you used to, you know, have to throw that up in the loft and get up there and stack them. And, it's probably 20 or 25 tiers high up in the loft because it's so big in the middle and we could, it was built extremely well. Big six by eight or eight by 10 timbers was what supported it, you know, underneath. So you could put all the weight in the world up there and it wouldn't hurt it. But that's how he did it. And he, you know, he just over the years, he got a lot of the hay went to Texas. Uh, I guess it was drier down there and they needed more hay and we'd have semi trucks come in here. And we'd load it out, you know, three, 400 bales on a truck throw it out and bale at a time, you know, and stack it. My dad did that for years and sold hay. Uh, that's how most of it got to market, you know, and, and we we used a lot on the farm, you know, we fed some of that for cattle, then we ground our own feed in. We had a, a grinder hooked on a little tractor with a little blade belly on it, and we, we'd run that little hammer mill usually every two or three weeks, Saturday morning usually, and we'd uh, grind up hay and uh, all other things that we had to put in it, you know, and, uh, and make ground hay out of it. And that's how he fed his calves out. You know, we didn't buy anything, hardly ever bought anything in store. Just we was almost self-sufficient. I'd say 95, 98 percent on the farm, everything. Okay. Wow. And today, um, your cattle are not pets. Well, uh, or a little bit maybe. Uh, some of them are. You know, you try not to make them pets. But, <laughs> Uh, seem like uh, uh, we've developed some at our pests and uh, of course the grandkids they come out and they want to feed everything and it's all fun for them and uh, we have some that come up and eat out of the pickup you know when you hold a cube out and now we've last three or four years we've got some donkeys and we have a little baby donkey now and of course that's a, about the main thing from coming to the farm now is to get to see the donkey we've got this cute little black donkey and Everybody hears about it, has to come see it, and it's it's a dandy. Well, do you have round bales of hay now, or are you? Yeah, pretty square? well all round bales. A few years ago, I bailed up one field of square bales, and you know I thought it'd make three or four hundred bales. I don't know much about farming like my dad did, and I thought, well, this bale it all, and we'd fertilize it really good. I think it made seventeen hundred some bales just one field, and uh, we got a barn out here, and we filled it plumb full. Of, Hey, and that lasts us till this year. We just fed the last few bales the other day. So I may bale a few square bales this year, but most of it, we hire a person to do it, and he just bales round bales. And we usually have three, 400 bales a year, you know, if we have enough moisture. But you spoke a little bit about uh, the tractor you're getting ready to restore in the uh -huh. next couple of years. Do you have any of the old uh, farm equipment still on the property? Yeah, there's some down here by the barn. We still have. Of course. Some horse-drawn stuff there. Uh, when we had the farm sale here, my dad's estate sale, we we sold most of the stuff off, and most of it wasn't very good then. You know, it was uh, all the old horse-drawn stuff that just laid outside for 30, 40, 50 years, and and uh, some of it wagon wheels and stuff. And my son bought some of them and left them here on the place. So we got a few pieces here stacked around the barn to let people know what it used to be like. Well, when you were growing up as a, as a youngster, like 10, 10 years old or so, when you came to visit grandparents, did you have a favorite room? Well, of course, see, when I, we, I, I lived here, mm -hmm. so we were here all the time. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I guess our favorite room was our bedroom upstairs. You know, we only slept in it. We'd come in, go up there late at night, and get up early in the morning. And back then, the old house was real, real open and very, very cold. And all we had, you know, while I was, the whole time I was in school, all, all we had was a wood stove. And that's how we had to farm. And 
you hear my dad up five o'clock every morning on you know, building a big old fire at this big old wood stove there in the living room and he'd get it hot, couldn't stand around it, but it didn't do much for the rest of the house. And I remember some nights we, we'd even have broken windows, you know, and I don't know, cause the windows up higher, we didn't have the money, but sometimes we just stuffed towels in them in them windows and, and stuff the holes up. But when the snow would come, sometimes we'd blow the towels out and blow snow in on our bed. I remember more than once waking up with snow over the top of my brother and I's bed. So did you have a favorite family meal from when you were growing up? Well, my mom was a great cook, but I guess maybe one of the most fam most famous things that we had here was her homemade bread. She made bread t at least two or three times a week, and she made the big loaves, and she might make seven or eight of those loaves. And my brother and I, when we were coming in, you know, grade school, high school age, but we'd come in and uh, she'd let us, most of the time we'd eat a whole loaf of peas, you know. We'd just take a loaf of bread and smear a little butter on it, and that's all we'd eat on it. No jelly, no nothing, but very, very good when it first comes out of the oven. And holidays? Holidays. Uh, we went to church real regular. Sundays was something that we always went to church on Sundays. All my life I grew up in a church. And uh, Dad was real strict on that. And uh, like 4th of July and some of those days, we did not work. Uh, we'd take off and we were like all kids. Uh, me and my uncle owned the store here. Well, we could always manage to get a few firecrackers out of the store. And uh, had, a, had a great time shooting them. And, Fishing was a big thing, you know, when it rained real hard and we couldn't work the fields, that's the only time Dad would take off and go fishing. And we used to take off and go down on the creek or down on the river. And, uh, you know, we, we catch a lot of fish to eat. Back then, everything we caught, we dressed and ate, eat and bring them home. And uh, we grew up on a lot of fish. Talk a little bit about his siblings, where they are now and, and bring us up to date. All right. My, uh, my immediate family. Um, I have one older sister, the one that was here in the picture a while ago, that had the station in Kendrick. Uh, she lives, she graduated here from uh, Kendrick and uh, she went on to uh, Oklahoma City and worked. Then from there her husband was in the Navy at Norman and they met and they went back and lived in Baltimore all their life. And they had just had one son and now she's, uh, she broke her hip a couple years ago and she's had a tough time recovering. but. Uh, she's been a diabetic for several years. She worked for the Army for years and years and in the, uh, in the Department of Army Research and stuff where used to when she'd come here on vacation when the FBI would always come around for three or four weeks after she was here and go to everybody and see if she talked to anybody and she would never ever say anything about where she worked because you worked at Army Chemical Center and I guess some, uh, a lot of stuff that she wasn't supposed to talk about, she didn't. She was very good about it. But anyhow, she retired from there and, and they both still live in, uh, they live in Baltimore, Maryland. They're both up in their high 80s and, uh, you know, they're not in very good health, but all of us are kind of getting that away. Uh, my older brother, next to my sister, he lives in Fort Worth now and he graduated from Oklahoma State University and got a degree there in 1955 and uh, he worked in the ASC office in Texas and ended up director of 14 southern states but now he's retired and he'll probably live in Fort Worth the rest of his life. Uh, my younger sister, uh, that they used to travel around all over the United States. Her husband went to OSU also and got a degree in, uh, in uh, cooking and uh, serving in big hotels and restaurants and managing them and he's, he's been with Hilton and all the big ones all over the United States. And they end up in Georgia where they bought their own business. And, and then after but she left down there, she went worked in Texas and Kansas. And now she's back in Georgia, retired. And she has MS and her health is not real good. But she has to be in a wheelchair, but she still managed to do things with her kids and grandkids. And uh, then of course, it's me and Sue, we live here in Lincoln County. I left here in 55 and spent five years in the Navy, then came back and went to work in the construction company in 60. And I've been here, it's been going on 50 years. 
that I've, I've been doing building homes and remodeling and that's all I know. Have, have any of those been home, been back here recently? Uh, my brother comes, he still has 80 acres here next to the farm and uh, we talk a lot and uh, he comes back uh, usually two or three times a year. He'll come back for a day or two and he likes to go down on his place and just hang out down there and you know, shoot his guns, target practice and stuff. My sister, my oldest sister hadn't been back four or five years. They used to always come every other year and my mom and dad would go out there every other year. So they seen each other once a year. Uh, my youngest sister, she used to come two or three times a year, but she's not been here either because of her health. It's harder for her to travel now than what it used to be. And, uh, you know, she's got a handicapped van that she drives the land and anywhere, goes everywhere, but it's got to be tough on her getting around. We hope to try to get around and go see her this year. And then what about your father's brothers and sisters? Where well, and of course, they're all deceased now, but uh, my dad's, uh, of course, oldest brother had the BMB store here in Kendrick. He started out in the bank there where his uh, first wife uh, parents owned the bank, and he kind of inherited that. Then from that he went and bought the B&B store and they owned it uh, for 43 years, I believe. And then when he got old, he sold it to uh, his brother, uh, Merle Blakely. He didn't sell it to him. Uh, when my uncle was working there in the store, well, they were real hard workers too. And we used to go there every night. Every single night we'd go there and talk and my dad helped him sometimes in the store. Then my Mom's mom and dad lived in Kendrick, and my grandpa Sutton on that side of the family had a, a stroke when I was pretty young, and we went to their house every night for eight or ten years, and uh, most of the time would stay all night with them, or a lot of some of us would, and we'd come back to the farm next morning time to go to work. But uh, then some of the other brothers that come out of here, one of the older boys was Glenn Blackley. He worked, worked in Northern Oklahoma and Kansas in the oil field all his life. And uh, all of them lived to be pretty old. Uh, my Uncle Glenn, the young one I just talked about in the oil field, he lived to be 93. I believe he was the oldest male and uh, two of the older girls lived to be in their 90s. So all of them lived to be in their 80s and 90s. <coughs> One of the things I didn't say about my uncle that had to be in me store, this was Leo Blakely, which was a, a professor at OSU, the Dean of Economics up there for several years. Why, well, uh, one morning he was going out to get a part of a beef and bring it in to cut it up. And uh, he had asked my other uncle to get it for him. He said, well, just a minute. And he was finishing up his conversation. And my uncle was kind of like my dad. They couldn't wait for nobody. They had to work. So he went out and got the beef and brought it in and throwed it down on the chopping block and he fell dead down on top of it. And he died there in the store. And he'd had a bad heart and everybody wanted him to retire, but you know, he'd talk to me and he said, but I'd rather die and have to go home and sit down. I said, well, work if you feel like it. And he worked for 10 years after he wasn't supposed to, but he lived to be 78 with a real bad heart. So uh, he did very well. Then uh, one of my sisters took both of my, uh, his sisters were uh, postmistress here in Kendrick and both of them had the post office there in Kendrick for years. And uh, one of my other uncles moved off and worked oil fields in Oklahoma and South Oklahoma. But uh, now they're all, they're all gone and uh, just what I call the second or third generation. And when I bought the farm, there was 23 cousins that owned the, farm because it was the whole 320 acres was undivided and uh, except the 40 here where my mom and dad lived they owned it and uh, we ended up buying it from the 23 cousins and uh, it was a long ordeal but we got it all down here a few years ago and now we own it me and the bank owns it <laughs> it's impressive that all that started from this one room here yeah it all started right here in this 14 of 18 room and uh, a lot of the a lot of the kids, uh, my generation, I guess that would be the third generation. A lot of them, you know, uh, fourth generation. They 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 live all over, you know. And the Blakeleys that live north of Kendrick, most of them, all of them, 
ended up in California. They all ended up in California in later years. But uh, in the early day, Kendrick was represented well with Blakely's. You know, I, I know up here at the store where they had the pictures of all of us graduating classes. Uh, oh, I don't know how many Blakely's in there, probably eight or 10 cousins, you know, in their pictures that graduated from Kendrick. Uh, as far as I know, every one of them went to Kendrick. And I think maybe every one of them graduated. We used to, one thing I didn't talk about, one, we used to have a little uh, a country school over here on the home place, right over here on the corner. No remnants of it there now, except a little bit of cement. But my brother went to school there his first and second year, then they closed it. And uh, it was just a little one room school there. I don't know how big it was, it wasn't real big, but yeah, it was kind of a neat place, you know. And of course, over the years, it's blew down or tore down or something. Not there anymore. Well, what year and what was the condition of, of this place that we're in right now before you decided to remodel it? Well, when I was a kid growing up, of course the roof was on it and it was pretty good shape. We used to raise pumpkins. We had a wind upstairs and the thing I remember more than anything is throwing them pumpkins up there through that little old bitty window. And we'd have a, at least a wagon load or maybe more. Sometimes I'd fill the whole upstairs nearly full of pumpkins. And I guess they just kept them up there till either winter was over or they rotted. And, you know, of course then, everything we ate was from raw pumpkin. We didn't know what a can of pumpkin was. And uh, mom would get pumpkins and make pumpkin pies all the time. And uh, that was kind of a neat thing to watch when we was growing up. But when I came along and after my dad kind of passed it up and put some tin on the side of it, you know, to keep it from rotting. And then, I kept looking at it every year and after I bought it then it was getting pretty rotten up on top and I kept thinking that uh, maybe I would uh, you know fix it up and I thought about the cost well maybe I can't afford to but I sent my boy that works for me Richard Simon out one day and I asked him I said Richard go out and see if you can tear that old log cabin down that's terrible dangerous I said kids will like get down there and that fall on him and he come down here and he was banging on the roof of a backhoe trying to knock it in and I guess it's a solid you know we just thought it was rotten it wouldn't knock in and my son uh, was living here then and he was upstairs sleeping he was a nurse in Oklahoma City at that time and he lived here and he come running out here and asked him what he's doing and he said well dad said tear it down I don't want to tear it down I want to save that so he pulled off and we let it go a few years then and uh, then we decided to tear it down and fix yeah. it up and oh well, three years ago now I guess it was well, it? we tore the roof off and fixed yeah, it all up the second he's doing and, an interview and uh, uh, we kind of fixed it up but uh, we, we fixed it up took us off oh, probably took us most of a year and a rock layer that worked for me laid us up a fireplace on the outside and the carpenter that I've got working for me now he had uh, he did some Walt Disney stuff in Florida and built some of these old cabins and when I talked to him about this, he said, oh yeah, I can do that. I, I used to do that for Walt Disney. And uh, it, we tore the logs all down about two foot high and took all the shims out, then put them back, chinched it all in with cement. And, uh, and we sprayed a sealer on the outside thinking that would seal it and make it last a little bit longer. We went back to the old native heavy wood shakes, you know, the roughest we could find. And, uh, you know, they should last 30 years or so, so. That's about all we can do to it, and I believe the outside will last. It's it's been pretty good. The, the window that we've got in, we put one of the windows back in. They were all gone. Gone. It came out of the house when we remodeled it back in the 40s, I believe, out of the frame house. So uh, that window was out of the house, and we we bought one of the doors from an antique dealer, and of course that one we had to put in new, and uh, we left the original stairway in the closet. And that, it, it's just exactly like it was, I guess, in 1989 when they built it. 1889. Huh? 1889. Did I say 1999? <laughs> You'll have to correct that. Oh, no problem. And even in the uh, in the cellar, you could see some of the original logs. Yeah, them was all. See, we, we was gonna knock all them out. In fact, we 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 tried to, and uh, we tried driving an ALM and everything. They were solid. They ride right on this corner, right up here a little bit. So we, we blocked that up and just left them all in there. And you know, you can see here how close they are. They're less than two foot apart. 
and we, we, we found some old shiplap we had there in the yard that's been laying there maybe 15, 20 years, and it's kind of weathered and kind of had a you know dark color to it. Well, boy, that'd be perfect. So we put that on there. I don't. Do we stain it? I don't think we did. Well, early on, how was the property lines marked? Uh, in the early day, all there was was just old fences that I remember, all out of wood. Uh, as far as I know, there wasn't any stone markers on it that I remember, rock markers. But uh, all the fence lines was, and all the posts was made out of old Bodoc cut posts. And uh, they were here, even some of them, when we started redoing the fences here in the 80s. And I know they'd been up, oh, for sure, 50, maybe 80 years. And those old posts just never rot out. They just, they just won't. They just stay hard forever. And they were just old, crooked, yoke-type posts, you know. Nothing pretty about them, like the old farms was in the early days. Looked like the Dust Bowl stuff, yeah. But uh, Dad just go along, stretch a little more wire up, and drive a few more stables, and he kept our cows in, and that's all we had to worry about. Did, did your father worry about record keeping back in the day? No, there was no record keeping. A little bit in his book, maybe, but it was kind of like mine. It was just all up here. Uh, he'd always say, yeah, I made money on them cows last year, but he worked out all his life, you know, and he made working out, made more working out than he could ever make, thinking about farming, so I, I don't really think he made any money ever farming, you know. But he, he did provide a good living and good food for us as we was growing up. We always had clothing to wear, and we always had plenty to eat. We never went hungry. And then, and the people I went to school with in Kendrick, a lot of people went hungry. A lot of them were as well off as we were. And what, you know, I think we were all poor then, but nobody knew it, you know. We just, we was all like, we wear jeans till they had big old holes in the knees, and wear our shoes till the, you know, toes punch out the front. But mom always made us wear them clean. That's one thing we never we never went dirty, but we didn't always have good clothes. Was there a difference between what the girls did and what the boys did for chores? Well, of course, my sister was quite a bit younger than I. She was about seven years younger than me, so she was just kind of a little spoiled kid. And Ben's the youngest, and uh, I, I would say that she didn't have to work as hard as we did. She thinks she did when you talk to her. Oh, mom made me, you know, and she was, we was talking the other day about plucking chickens, you know, you know what you do to pluck a chicken. And uh, I used to have, you know, kill 50 of them for mom to, to you know, clean and butcher. And uh, she said, oh, I told mom I wasn't doing that. Well, boy, I wouldn't thought about telling mom I wasn't going to do something. <laughs> <coughs> that was all part of it. <coughs> Growing up was uh, raising a big garden and everything. Well, do you remember uh, any piece of advice or words of wisdom that your father passed down to you about running this place? Well, I probably didn't listen very good. Uh, he said I didn't, because one time he was telling me, when he was running the station there in Kendrick, he run the station all day, then he would load a carload of cotton at night, and he, him, his brother helped him some, and sometimes he had to do it by himself. And he was supposed to get one car a night out. So he had to, you know, that all had to be just pitchfork. That's all it could have been. Just loading a, a, a whole car load. And that was a lot of cotton. I don't know how much, but a lot. And uh, he had said that he'd, he'd quit about five or six at the station and go down there and work. He said, sometimes I'd get back five, five thirty in the morning. Sometimes I wouldn't get back till I had to open, maybe seven, you know. And this went on, I guess it probably didn't work Sunday. But that man went on five or six days a week, you know, the whole time he was running the station there. And that's how he worked, to, to be able to survive. But uh, he, he told me one time, I said, Dad, how come you didn't talk to me about saving that money? He said, the reason I he come to that, he said, well, you know, when I was making a dollar a day back in the Depression, he said, I, we always try to save a dime. I said, well, how come you didn't teach me? He said, maybe you didn't listen. <laughs> So he probably hit it, and maybe I, because, you know, boy, I like spending that money. <laughs> Still do. <laughs> We'd work all summer, you know. He made it, after we was about seven days grade, well, we paved our way from then on. We had, we worked during the summer and buy our clothes, and then we could spend the rest of it during the year. 
done, the fairs was gone. By the time I made the county and state fair, well, it might have just about been gone. <laughs> Well, what'd you do for fun when you weren't working? Oh, we swam a lot. We'd go to the ponds. That was always a big thing. We had a pond over here on the school lease. Uh, uh, my dad put a big diving board over there in the 40s when I was a real little kid. We used to go in there would be 50, 60, 70 people. Kids from Kendrick come out on Sunday afternoon and swim. And we pretty always did that. And we rode horses a lot. Uh, we, we always had a horse. I had a horse named Tony when I was growing up. and and I rode him everywhere. You know, I'd go town at night, and I'd tie him up, he'd slip his bridle off, and I'd have to walk home. He'd never come home without me. He'd stop right here at Norfolk House and wait for me. He'd be there when I got there, and I'd get the bridle and put it on him and come on home. And I never did tell Dad that he's slipped Alder off, because he'd, he'd got after me if I would have. But, you know, he thought I'd tie him up there, and he was staying. But it didn't matter how tight I tied him, he could get that thing off. But Sunday afternoon, we used to, we, we raced horses, you know. If anybody wanted to race, well, I'd ride anything, so they'd let me have their horse, and, and we'd pair up with somebody else. We had a herd that had a fast horse. And we'd line up somewhere, and away we'd go, you know. And ride a bareback, that's all we had, was bareback, you know, wide open like a race horse, but it was fun. We got, I got bucked off, threw off, run over, and everything else, but I, Sure lucky, he never got hurt on one except one time. I was on crutches. Back then, we didn't have a doctor. You know, we had one, but we didn't go. And I fell off horse one time, and the horse rolled over on me. And I couldn't get around for about four or five months. And, and then my uncle had a pair of crutches at the store, so we'd go get the crutches, you know, when somebody got hurt. I hobbled around on them for a long time. During the summertime, I think I went to school a month or two in the fall. but. And it's just, just the way it was. We, we kind of did what we had. Well, a little bit along that same line, did you have any home remedies? Oh, probably not none of my own. Mom had a, all of them and Dad had all of them, you know. I know uh, Dad's deal was if he got, got he chewed beach nut then just fiercely, you know, all the time. <coughs> and if you got stung by a bee, why? He'd slap that on your lip or where it was, you know, a big old hunk of that old chewing back. He'd just hold it on there, hold that, you know, and then run down here. <laughs> One time we was down in the bottom hunting and he said, see that squirrel? I said, no, no a rabbit. He said, see that rabbit? I said, no, I don't see it. No, go a little bit left, a little bit left. And I got just about right and he shot this big old wasp nest out and he drifted down on it and stung me three or four times. And he just laughed. He sat there and laughed up the storm, you know. And it just stung me all over my face and everything. And I, it was starting to make me sick, you know. I was just starting up a storm running around there. I was probably eight, nine years old. And he said, come here. And he go over and he took all that out and packed it on my face and made me lay down. Oh, that stung so bad. That <laughs> <laughs> was a lot worse than, than the wasp sting. <laughs> oh, anything to have fun. We we used to have the, the kids out from Kendrick, you know. and. Uh, we always pulling stuff on them, you know. We, we had a lot of tricks we'd pull on them. Ride horses along, and the person up front, pull them back, turn it loose, and knock them off their horse. You know, that was fun. We'd rope each other like cowboys and Indians. <laughs> we did that all the time. That was just a day's run, you know. And jerk each other out of the saddle, just. Well, but we never got hurt, so we were just lucky. You're at 56. You're at 56? No, I said, you live close to Route 66. Do you have any stories about that? <coughs> no, not too many. We, we we got to Davenport. That's closest to us, or Chandler. You know, we, we when I got older, we went to Chandler on Saturday evening sometime, and we'd go to the show, had a show there, so we'd always go to the movie show on Saturday night. I think it was a dime, and maybe a dime for a sack of popcorn. And... Uh, Mom and Dad went to a little grocery store there and bought their groceries and sat around talking, you know, on Saturday night. And the rest of the time, they went to Kendrick, but on Saturday night, they went to Chandler. And uh, I guess some of the fun things I remember about 66 have been the last few years when they have uh, all the car shows and stuff come through. And uh, we had it on the station there in Davenport right on the curve. And we used to go down there on Saturday morning when they was having this and sat there under the canopy, you know, 
and uh, watching old cars go by, be all types of Chevette clubs and different types of clubs come through. The last few years over at Chandler, we've seen a lot of people from England. You know, they, they fly over and bring their cars over and get on 66 and travel all the way to the West Coast, and I guess get on a plane there and fly back to England. It's, it's really something. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you ready? I guess so. Okay. Tell me how you met your wife. How did I meet my <laughs> wife? Well, <laughs> which one? This is my second wife, too. Uh, I met her in, uh, I don't know what year it was, I guess 70s. Sometime. We've been married 30 years or longer. I don't. I can't keep up with time. See, that's why when I put you on the spot, it's like, yeah. oh, uh, I'm uh, not uh, sure. Uh, I bet she knew how long she's been married. Yeah. Well, yeah, she probably, <laughs> she probably does. But uh, I don't know where she come to Lumberyard and... When I first started seeing her, I just can't remember how it was, but uh, she had two boys, and uh, of course my two boys were older, almost out of high school when all this happened, and, and uh, her two boys was, they were, the youngest one, you know, he's our electrician now, works, does houses for us, but he was kind of on her little thing, he, <laughs> he was always fun to be around. <coughs> well, tell me what your, your favorite spot on the farm now is? My favorite spot is probably over on the back side right in the middle of the mile section up on the hill. I kind of got me a place there. I could talk Sue into it and things would go just right. We might build a house over there but so far from everything we'd have to run a half mile telephone, half mile electric, half mile of road and uh, hard to do that you know <laughs> keep it in your budget but I always kind of wanted to maybe live over there it's peaceful Pick up there and you can see most all the farm. Can't quite see it all, but I can see down the bottom here, the, the north half I can see. You can see um, just about all the farm from there. Probably 250 acres of it. And sit there and watch a deer run across, squirrels, or whatever. We got a lot of geese here since I've been planting a lot of wheat and oats. And uh, sometimes we'll have 300 head of geese wow. on the fields, you know. And, I guess once in a while somebody else shoot one or two, but we don't hunt them or anything. We just let them eat. You know. They eat up some of the wheat and stuff for the cows. But they're kind of fun to one. So what do you see happening with the farm into the future? Well, hopefully, you know, we're going to get a family trust set up and uh, keep it in a family name for a while. And I'll probably look towards Skip to kind of look after that. And uh, maybe after he is gone, maybe... Our granddaughter, that's a softball coach in Devonport, ever's really level-headed, and I think uh, that uh, she would do a good job looking after. Him. You know, we don't know how long she'll be here. She may end up the success she's had here. You know, she may end up coaching either in a big city or a college somewhere. You know, we just don't know. But uh, hopefully, they'll keep the interest here. They have two boys. Uh, she has two boys that uh, come out here a lot to the farm and they really do enjoy it. My great grandsons. I have seven grandchildren. You always crack me, but uh, set, I think seven great and seven <laughs> grandchildren, but somewhere thereabouts. Do you ever have uh, big family gatherings back at the farm? Not very much. Uh, Skipper has his family out here some. They, you bring your kids out a couple times a year, don't you? Always have a Halloween deal out here. They, he gets them on the tractor. And we got a back road built all the way across the farm. And, uh, you know, I can go over and go through the farm, rain or shine, on a gravel road and uh, see the backside of the farm. Ever get lost? Oh, well, not lately. <laughs> <laughs> My dad did when he got old. He kind of lost his mind and oh bless his heart. He, they called one night and he was trying to get on Turnpike and Stroud. He didn't know where he was at, you know. So. It seems to me, it seems like a lot of land and it would be easy to get turned around a bit. Well, you know, I knew the stuff. land and then clearing it, you really learn the land. I mean, you know, when we cleared this, no telling how many hundred hours I spent out here, probably helping a little bit. I helped burn a lot of brush and uh, I always had a dozer operator did the work and 
I've always had people that are real good friends of mine that worked out here. Bud Foster, in fact, he worked up at OSU in the maintenance program up there up till he came back to work at about 10 years ago, maybe. He worked for me a long time and he went up there and did his retirement. As soon as he got in, he came back and went back to work for me. And he built all these ponds. I think he built all, every one of them, all cleaned out two, cleaned out one and built nine. So, you know, we, we hope to put a sign up there kind of dedicated to him because when he had cancer and he was so bad, he shouldn't even be out here. He'd want to come out here and get on that dose and work. Best and therapy it, for him. It, well, it really was. And his, his wife and I went to school together here at Kendrick. And <laughs> get back. Well, do you have any, I'm sure with, with a farm of this size and close ties to this, to this land, uh, you probably have lots of family memories, but do you have any any final family memories with your your father or your mother or your brothers or sisters that you'd like to share for us? Oh, I have a lot. Some of the favorite memories I might have, of course, I always enjoyed. I enjoyed with my dad more than anything. When I came back here, went to work. He said, "Won't you come to work with us?" Well, I went to work thinking I, you know, they they didn't make a lot of money, to, but I thought I'd make less than he did. You know, I didn't know nothing. And he said, no, you, you get paid the same as I do. I mean, that's just the way he was. He wanted me to get paid what he did. And I really appreciate that. But uh, probably appreciated him more working with him some before I bought the lumber yard out in 1964. He and I built about 15 houses, just me and him. And uh, I'm gonna tell you the first story on that. I was working for my uncle and I, I'd only worked a few months with him, and we was building a school teacher there in Davenport's house, Pauline McCracken, and we framed it in. I was just a helper, you know, handing boards. I didn't know nothing. And uh, <clears throat> she said, but I've got a, an old wood, oak table that laid out in Macon Grove. You care if something looked a lot like that right there? And I said, would you look at that? And I looked at it, and it's just about what it looked like, in fact. And I took it all apart, and I went, bought me a belt sander, and then I bought a router to route the edges with it, you know. And I worked on that thing probably three weeks while I was framing on that house. Every day I'd work on it. And she'd come looking, oh, it's so beautiful. So one day I was there working on her house, and we was, I don't know if we were sheetrocking or ready to sheetrock, or I think we may have sheetrocking. And she come to me and she said, I want you to trim my house and build my cabinets. I said, just pump my mouth. I I couldn't do none of that, you know. I said, well, I, don't, I, I don't think I don't know if I can do that or not, Paul. I said, uh, I'd have to talk to Uncle Roy, you know, because I really liked him. He was a good guy. So I go to him and I said, Uncle Roy, would you get mad if I told you that uh, Pauline wants me to build her cabin? Hell, she does. I'll just go somewhere else and go to work. He loaded his tools up and I was on my own. That's how I started the construction business on that house. And uh, Tammy's mother lives in that house now. She died and uh, she remarried Skipper's mother-in-law. And they live in that house now. It's house half down in Davenport. Nice house, still there. But that kind of gave me my start in the construction business. And I got real close to my dad after he developed cancer. We never spent a lot of father and son time together. It was always just working thing, you know. And that's just the way he was, and I guess I was, you know. We'd come out here on mom's birthday or when my sisters was here, you know, we'd have a big family get together there and have a, she always makes big meals. Great, great cook. But when he got cancer then, I took him, Sue's dad got cancer first, and we took him back and forth, I think 32 times, to St. Francis in Tulsa. Then uh, when he got it, we took him 39 times back and forth. Then my uncle got it and took him back about the same amount. So we made over 100 trips to uh, St. Francis Hospital for radium treatments, you know, with both all of them cancer. I got real close to my dad then because, you know, he, he started talking about some of this stuff that we talk about now that I didn't know about, you know. Well, he had to uh, break out of diseases when he was a kid. I think he was five or six years old. 
he was the only one in the family that did get it. He said, I was the only one that did get it, and I had to take care of everybody. And he just felt like he'd do that all his life, you know. And he was really good about taking care of people. And uh, when I come along, well, that kind of, it hurt me. It was, but I learned to talk to him. We talked about death. And, you know, he was ready for it, but he was worried about my mom. She had Alzheimer's, and uh, he, he knew it before we did, actually. And I didn't realize it so much until after he died. But he said, now, she can't take care of herself. I said, well, yeah, I will take care of her, Dad. And I had a uh, good friend of ours that went to school with my sister. He said, but do you care if I come out and stay with Lola one night? I said, no, that's fine. Come out here. She'd been hearing about it, you know. And she'd come back to me next morning, real early next morning. I just got to love her. She said, you, you got to put her to rest on Oh, I can't do that. I told Dad we'd take care of her. You can't take care of her. She's going to kill herself and burn that house down. And she'd turn the gas stove on, you know, and he'd click, click, click. We'd come along hours later and it'd still be clicking, you know, and propane wouldn't come on. I don't know how it kept igniting and killing everybody, but, you know, I'm just lucky. So that was kind of close for me being by him. You know, I enjoyed that. And when my younger sister was growing up, well, I put her through a lot of trouble because I was always trying to do things. I thought about myself instead of her. And I'd make her run like a calf, you know. And I'd throw that rope and jerk her down. A little bit of skinny thing, you know. I'd jerk her back. Oh, but, but that hurt. You know, and I'd be pumping her on her bicep and she'd fall off. I asked her, well, back she remember that. No, I remember going down there and we just got gravel put on this road. Old native gravel, they dug out a farm across the road. Spread it on there, an old rough rock, you know, about that big. I just pulled my cat and my foot slipped off. One I did, she just fell over, just went in front on her breast, you know. She was about nine, probably. Just peeled her shirt off. Made her look terrible. I felt so bad about that. I was always, I about killed her about three times. It was always because I was daring. Coming down this hill one time, I had 125 bales of hay on, we loaded up at Kenry on a big old, wagon and a little bitty tractor, a little bitty tractor. And I kicked it out in neutral top of the hill. You know, worst thing you could do. And I got to bum that hill and I was rolling. Well you still is. A rock ledge across there, you know, just kinda of rolled up like that. Well I got to it and I hit my brakes and what I did was well, I don't know, I kinda of got that wagon kinda of juggle or something. When I went over that rock, it threw them and about half of that load of hay over but it threw them past the fence here, past the fence, and hay hit around them just like this. Her and a boy from Kendrick was on there, and it didn't scratch me. Uh, I was pretty fortunate growing up. Good Lord was looking after me, I guess, or looking after everybody. It sounds like it. <laughs> uh, I, I look back on that. I had a lot of those kind of deals. It was always because I was doing something I wasn't supposed to. Always. Run the tractor wide open, you know. Look, that load of hay, that's stupid. You're going down the hill, you know, you're supposed to drive slow. Now, the, according to the uh, Centennial Farms, it's called the uh, Blakely Farms. Yeah, we never did. People said, why don't you call it a ranch? You got all them cows. I said, well, come my dad and my grandpa was great farmers. They were, my grandpa, they said, was a, was just like a picking machine on corn, you know. And my dad was that way. He'd just pick corn, you know, throw it against the side on the wagon, you throw it in there, and it goes in there, and we'd, he'd have a team, a uh, team and wagon, you know, and he'd, they'd get over there, and he'd just throw into it, and I'd get one row, and he'd get three. And he, I'd be behind, and he'd get up there, bud. And he was always on me to get up there. And well, I know I was dreaming about going to school and having fun, you know, I wasn't dreaming about that old corn. <laughs> but uh, those was good days, you know, I look back on it and God, I'm glad he worked me like that. I'm so glad. Did he call it anything else before you, you decided to? No, I don't think so. I get just, you know, really never had a name for it. We never, it never was anything, you know, it wasn't a ranch or nothing. It's just, uh, you know, and Sue, uh, I guess just kind of named Blakely Farms, you know. It's kind of what we felt like it should be because, you know, the hard work my dad did and my grandpa did is the only reason we got it, you know, we'd never have it went to that. 
because he was the only one of the boys, I think, only one of them nine kids that had any interest in it, you know. And uh, he was a hard worker, very hard worker, more than probably you, most of us ever meet in our lifetime. I had one person, two people that's worked for me, and probably out of 400, 600 people that's close to close to him. These two people was kind of close to him, and that's all. As far as what he could do and would do, the amount of work and time and effort he put into doing everything he did. Wasn't a great carpenter. He might have door nails all over that thing. <laughs> where was where were we at that time? Dallas? Yeah, it was at Baby Doe's in Dallas. We went down and they had to, you know, been in one of them or not, they got the mole mining shaft down below, you know, it's all made like a mine. And that's where the bathrooms are at. We go down through this, you know, poles and like that, and logs. You go over there and Bob Walker is a trim carpenter for me and uh, another guy, and they were there, and they were laughing. I seen the enemy as I was going back. I wonder what they found so funny. And they would point up at it, and they just die laughing. I got closer to them and said, Harley framed that, and they just laughed. <laughs> that was my dad's name, Harley. And they broke in under him, and they knew how rough and crude he was. It wouldn't fall down. I, I've got a good friend who lives out east of Kendrick. My dad built her house for, oh, I guess, four years ago or so. When he, he worked for me, see, after I got the lumberyard, and he went to work for me, worked for me for 30 years. And uh, she said, that's the strongest house I've ever seen in my life. That's a bet, you know, she just, everywhere I'd go, I'd be a whole crowd of people, and she'd have to get up and tell what a great builder I was. <laughs> Can't hear you, Myrtle. <laughs> <laughs> so how many homes do you think you've built in the area? In Over 1,600, area? we think. Wow. And we've probably remodeled, I don't know how many more, you know. We used to probably remodel them as we built. And we carpeted probably three or 4,000. Uh, we had a big, two big carpet crews for 25 years in Davenport, 30. And uh, Marion had worked for me 44 years, went to work for me right after I was married to his wife, I mean his sister, excuse me, uh, before, uh, you know, went, went to work. And uh, after we got divorced, I, I told him, and he said, well, I knew you before you all were married. I'll work for you if you want me to. And he's the greatest guy I ever had, you know. He, he was uh, really good. He, he, he did everything. He thought about my interest on everything he did. And now, you know, since he quit a couple of years ago, I said, where's the man? Where's the man? They, everybody asked for him. Because he'd get to a job, you know, and he, we got to do something, bud. And he'd jump on the skipper. That's skipper's uncle, you know. He said, I don't care. You got to get, you got Well, and he'd get on him, and skipper would get around and get him what he needed, you know, to get it fixed. <laughs> it's so, a, lot, a lot of fun going out. Of is a... Is Bud a family name? That's a nickname. I know you'd get around to that. <laughs> when I was real small, my grandpa started calling me Bud, and my I maybe called my brother Sonny, but Earl was Sonny and I was Buddy. Was Buddy and Sonny, that's all. Oh, most people don't even know my name. They'll come to town and look for Buddy Blakely. Bud Blakely, you know, and they look in the book, it's Irvin R. Blakely. And uh, they go down, a lot of times they go to barbecue. You know about Blackley? He said, well, I love him above now. I said, well, that's, he's other than Blackley. Do you have any Well, is there anything else you'd like to add that I haven't asked you about today or Tanya hasn't mentioned? No, I just, uh, you know, hope when Sue and I are gone that my kids, grandkids, will, you know, try to keep some of the Blackley name here if they can. You know, it might not always be feasible to. Uh, my dad always said, you know, uh, we'll keep it till we have to sell it. And it's kind of the way we feel, you know, if we can afford to keep it, we'll try to. We've been trying to sell our business out, and if we could get that sold, uh, you know, and pay off our farm home, we'd be all right. But businesses aren't selling right now, so it's kind of been a tough year to try that. I'm just thankful you all come down and interviewed us. We're, we're very happy about this. Uh, most of this comes from my wife, Sue. And even Skip, he, he's helped a lot out here at the farm, and we appreciate both of them. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to meet with us. Well, I've enjoyed doing it. I love to talk about the farm, 
and 30 years ago, uh, you couldn't even get me to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I ain't going back to there. That's hard work. <laughs> well, it's it's a beautiful farm, and it's you know you restored it very nicely, and, and I hope you. your family can enjoy it for years to come. We had uh, we kind of had a grand opening thing here, right? If we got the log cabin done. We have our alumni banquet every year at Kendrick, and we still have 160 people. And the last high school we had here was in 1962. And from 1962 back, and Leo Blakely is the oldest alumni now. He's 89, going on 90 years old. And he graduated in 1936 up here at Kendrick. And he was a parade marshal last year and drove his dad's old car, the little 54 Oldsmobile. How neat. And, uh, it's after that we announced, you know, uh, that day after they had their little parade that morning, uh, we was going to have open house and just out of nowhere, here comes 150 people out here. Then uh, last year we had uh, the farmers from all over Lincoln County. They honored us a couple years ago, I guess it's been now, right after we had maybe our 100th year. And we had them out here, a real beautiful day, and had them out here under this big old tree, it wasn't, top blew out of it then. And uh, some of my friends come out and cook for us, you know, and fix really a nice meal. And we we took them on, we had two tractors, trucks, and we, we took them and went around the whole place. And, you know, I made my, probably talk more than I should, but I talked about how we changed the farm from, you know, we used to have ditches bigger than this ditch right here, all over that back farm. You could put 10 bullets down there and you couldn't see them from the road. But now you can just shut your eyes down down through there. We leveled it all up. I had uh, uh, my cousin's wife one time. He was pretty silly anyhow. Uh, he had been in Korea. And I, he must, maybe just part of the Sutton family, but he was coming out to Frail Pecans one night about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. That's how he did things. And gonna go pick up pecans. And his wife was in the front seat with him. And, he was driving along there and not knowing where he's going up there in the pasture and they slammed into a ditch and threw her through the windshield. She liked to bled to death. She, he come down here to the house and got my dad. He didn't want my dad to go up there. No, dad, I'll take the tractor and get it out. I'm gonna go. Oh, dad. You know, so he goes up there and there she is just bleeding. He just threw it and pick up and rushed to the hospital. You know, she probably died if it wasn't. And I've, every time I think about cleaning the place up, I think about Mary. She was such a little bitty thing, you know, just such a nice little lady. But, you know, if I can keep that from happening ever again, I'm going to do that. You know, he shouldn't have been out of here. That was kind of a really thing to do. But anyhow, he, he stayed with us when he was a kid. A lot of people stayed with us when they was kids, you know. He'd come back to Uncle Harley and Aunt Lola. Dad work them just like he did us. <laughs> but they fed them good and he got to go swimming tonight. So they like that. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Well, you're welcome.